videotape. On it, a recording of a play. Sound and vision. Costing thousands to produce and now... Wiped. Gone forever. Lost. It is an undeniable truth that television is a cornerstone of British pop culture. Since it first arrived on our little isle in 1936, it has always been impactful. From the famous Mickey Mouse cartoon that aired at both start and end of the Second World War, to England's triumphant victory over Germany in the 1966 World Cup final, television can truly be called a window to our nation's past. And TV remains a driving force in our culture, with primetime shows regularly receiving millions of viewers. And in an era of the World Wide Web, with video streaming at our fingertips, TV is more accessible than ever. We can watch and re-watch our favourites whenever we like. Television is repeatable, and television is permanent. But it hasn't always been like this. In the early days, television was an ephemeral medium. Much like theatre, it was to be watched once and then never seen again. Enjoyed, and then destined to be forgotten. This attitude largely stemmed from technical limitations. To record TV shows, you needed videotape, and a lot of it. Using early technology, it would take over 14 miles of tape to record one half-hour TV show. That's over 260 football pitches. Some programmes were telerecorded, meaning that a studio monitor would be videoed with a film camera, making a film copy that could be shipped all around the world to air in different countries. This method left a lot to be desired. Footage was often of dubious quality, with sloped sides and serrated edges. Also, any debris on the screen would also appear on the footage, showing all kinds of dirt and dust. A particularly egregious example comes with this episode of the Quatermass Experiment, where an insect can be seen crawling on the screen. Then, in 1956, quadruplex was invented. Quadruplex, or two-inch quad, was a tape format invented by Ampex. It could record at a rate of 15 inches per second, meaning a 30-minute show could be recorded on just under half a mile of tape. That's only eight football pitches, a massive improvement. So now that TV shows could be recorded with relative ease, you'd think that more TV shows would have survived. Well, the tape was extremely expensive, costing 300 US dollars per reel. In modern money, that's 2,812 dollars, or 2,280 pounds, for one hour of TV. It was also ridiculously bulky. One reel of two-inch quad tape weighed 13 kilograms. That's the same as three house bricks. That meant that archiving TV shows needed an awful lot of shelf space, and it was shelf space many companies did not have. However, one of the big benefits of Quadruplex was that it was very easily rewritable. Just one quick spin on the tape wiper machine and its contents were gone forever. The tape was good as new, ready to be re-recorded, with not a trace of its old contents remaining. For many companies, the choice was a simple one. Either maintain an expensive and bulky archive and constantly buy new tapes, or wipe and reuse the ones they had. In their minds, nobody would want to rewatch TV. The programmes were worthless, so they might as well save the money. They didn't know the value of these cultural artefacts, and they certainly didn't think that people would want to watch them 50 or 60 years down the line. Eventually, people saw the value of television, and archives began preserving footage on a consistent and thorough basis. For example, the East Anglian Film Archives, an archive in Norwich that has everything from 1890s films to news reports from Anglia TV News. They were founded in 1976, and were the first regional archive in the UK. So my name is Sean Kelly. Um, I work at the East Anglian Film Archive and I'm at the archive as the archive education technologist. This is quite a long-winded uh, way of saying that basically I work with technology at the archive but also work in education. It's important that we make sure that we can pass the old material to the future um, for people to use, obviously, to make sure it is usable. It's also very entertaining, obviously very beautiful, um, history of technology, there's lots of different ways and reasons why it's very, very important to ensure that the material is um, accessible in the future. Going back to the beginning of film, we now know that only like 15 to 20 percent of all films made before 1930 survive. One of the reasons for that is, again, it's the cultural value of the stuff was not seen as being 
valuable to keep. It was a commodity that had a temporary lifespan, um, and people preferred just to burn the film and get back the silver that was used to make the film in that kind of um, quality, in that kind of aspect. A lot of shows from the 50s and 60s have missing episodes, including beloved classics. For example, the entirety of the second series of Dad's Army had its master copies wiped, and only half the episodes were later recovered. 60% of the episodes of Police Procedural Z cars are missing, which makes 480 episodes in total. In fact, the pilot episode only survives as the engineer who was supposed to wipe it kept the film copy, as it was his children's favourite show. Children's shows were by far the most targeted. They were considered far less valuable than adult programming, as they generally weren't exported. The BBC wiped children's shows all the way up until the early 90s, as they could no longer afford to transfer the two-inch quad when updating their archives. Their argument was that a lot of kids' TV shows were very similar to each other, episode by episode. Who would care if they kept 20 episodes of Play School, or 200, if they were nearly all the same content-wise? This belief led to some significant losses. Classic children's series Crackerjack is missing 303 episodes, a significant chunk of the show's run. Vision On, a show for deaf children, is also missing a large portion of its earlier episodes. The Adventures of Twizzle, an early show by Gerry Anderson of Thunderbirds fame, has only one surviving episode. And Whirligig, a show that ran for six whole years, is survived by only a single three-second clip. You know what this means, Jim? Though the it's children who love up. these shows are now all grown up, <laughs> many are still very unhappy about the destruction the of their favourite yes, shows. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it's a shame for sort of younger viewers who, you know, they may want to look back at older episodes of children's programmes and... And um, the viewers as well who saw the originals, who may very well want to look at them again, and they've all been lost, you know. Having programmes completely obliterated, not as a record, you've lost a lot to tell future children what our generations were brought up with. But they've really done a disservice to, to everybody uh, because it is social history and they should have been kept. So with so much out there to be found, what can people like us do to help? Well, quite a lot actually. Firstly, you can check your attics, cupboards and garden sheds. Lost films and TV shows turn up all over the place. But even if you don't have any hidden treasures, there is still plenty you can do to help. You could volunteer at your local archive, or even help online. While we live in a world of increasing media saturation, the value inherent to the content we make is being realised more and more each day. These things aren't ephemeral, they're our culture, our world. They're who we are, they're who we'll be for future generations. They're us. While people in the past may have seen fit to throw away their cultural artefacts like they were valueless trinkets, we live in a future where our creations are preserved and catalogued for generations to come. So. Before you watch that old black and white movie, or switch on those ancient TV reruns, give a thought to what's been lost, the little gems that fell through the cracks, and please think of those who hope for the day when what's lost will be found.